In this video, we're going to be doing a second example problem involving static friction. You can see here that I have a mass moving on a horizontal surface. And I'll put in some hash marks to indicate that that is a frictional surface. And you can see that we have a rope which is connected to the mass. The rope is oriented 40 degrees above the horizontal. Now, what's going to happen is that whoever is pulling onto this rope is going to gradually pull harder and harder until the mass begins to slip along the floor. So now we're going to do our second example problem involving static friction. In this problem, I have a, a mass sitting on a horizontal floor. Initially, the mass is not moving. We have a rope attached to the mass, and the rope makes a 40 degree angle with the horizontal. Now what's going to happen is that whoever is going now what's going to happen is that whoever is pulling on the rope is going to start by pulling gently, but then that person is going to gradually pull harder and harder. And eventually, when that person is pulling hard enough, that box is going to slip along the floor. So we want to know what is the tension in the rope just before the box slips. So we're going to solve this problem using the handout that we've been using. Step one says draw a sketch of the problem. OK, we have a sketch. Step two, A, says select an object from the sketch and draw a dotted line around the object. So let's do that. Okay, now as usual, as I proceed with this process, I'm gonna make a clean figure over to the side. Okay, so now let's go through the rest of step two. So 2B, draw the gravitational force vector acting on the object. So that's going to be pointing straight down. Okay, so 2C, go around the dashed line and note any locations where the dotted line makes contact with the object's surroundings. Okay, so let's say that we start down here. Now, as I go around the dashed line, I can see over here, the floor is reaching in through the dashed line to contact the mass. Now, the floor can exert two different forces on the mass. We would have the normal force pushing up. And we would also have a frictional force and in this case, because the box has not yet begun to slide along the surface, that would be a static frictional force. So I'm going to come into the bottom surface here and put in a static frictional force, F sub S. Okay, and then continuing around the dashed line, we can see where the string or the rope is reaching in through the dashed line to touch the box. So I'm going to come up to here and put in a tension force. Actually, I'm going to have that tension force reach all the way back to the center so that we can see the components more easily when we get to that point. OK, so now we have gone through step 2C. Step 2D says label each vector. So you can see that I already have the force vectors labeled with the vector symbols. Now I'm going to go around and put in the magnitudes, magnitude of the gravitational force, mg, magnitude of tension, t, magnitude of normal force, n. Now we get to the static friction force, and we have discussed earlier that the static friction force will be whatever it needs to be up to some maximum value to prevent sliding motion between two objects with surfaces in contact. Right? So let me write that out. Recall that the static friction force 
will take on a value between zero and some maximum so as to oppose sliding motion between two objects with surfaces in contact. So the question here is whether the static friction force is actually taking on its maximum value at the moment that we're analyzing it. In this situation, the static friction force is taking on its maximum value. The reason the static friction force is taking on the maximum value is that we have gradually increased the tension force to bring the box to the point where it is just almost going to slip. In other words, if we would increase the tension force even slightly more, then the box would slip, which means that at this exact moment, the static friction force is maxed out. So in this case, we can say that the magnitude of the static friction force is equal to the maximum value. And we recall that the maximum possible value of the static friction force equals the coefficient of static friction times the magnitude of the normal force. So I'm going to take this expression and put it into the figure. Okay, so now we have gone through step two here. Step three, introduce a Cartesian coordinate system. And as we have discussed in the previous videos, we want to align the axes of our coordinate system so that as many vectors as possible line up along one axis or the other. And here you can see that standard orientation will do just fine. Three of the four force vectors will line up with one axis or the other if we use the standard orientation. So I'm gonna come into the figure and we have y axis, x axis, The tension vector will make an angle theta with the plus x direction, where we call that theta equals 40 degrees. Now we go to step four, which is to make and fill in the grid where we put the x and y components of all the forces. So here I encourage you to try to make and fill out the grid on your own. Okay, so we have gravitational force, tension force, normal force, static friction. We need X and Y components. All right, so I hope you have already given this a shot on your own to try and fill out the grid. But anyway, let's do it together now. So gravitational force X component is zero, gravitational force Y component minus MG. Okay, now tension force X component would be here. That would be T times cosine theta. Tension force Y component would be here. So this would be T sine theta. The normal force has no X component, but points entirely along the plus Y direction. This Y component is N. Uh, the static friction force has no Y component, but points entirely along the minus X direction. That's minus mu S times N. All right, so now we have completed step four, and we're going to go to the first condition of equilibrium. Okay, so the sum of the X components of the forces must be zero. The sum of the Y components of the forces must be zero. So to sum the X components of the forces to zero, we read along the top row. 
So we have tension cosine theta minus mu S N equals zero. Then read along the bottom row. We have minus mg plus t sine theta plus n equals zero. Okay, so we're trying to solve for tension. So let's go through the two equations and mark the unknowns. If we go back to here and compare to the equations, you can see that the unknowns would be the tension and the magnitude of the normal force, everything else is given. So you can see that we have here two equations and two unknowns. And with two equations and two unknowns, we need to solve simultaneously. But let me number the equations one and two. Okay, so this is the first time we're coming up against two equations and two unknowns. And I have some standard advice that I like to give in this kind of situation. When we have two equations and two unknowns, I'd like to say start by solving the simpler equation for the unknown we are not interested in. So in this problem, the unknown we're not interested in, not really, is the magnitude of the normal force because the problem didn't ask us to solve for that. We're more interested in the tension. So we're going to solve the simpler of the two equations for the normal force. I would say the simpler equation is one because there's two terms instead of three. So let's just solve equation one for the normal force. Okay, so equation one, rearranging a bit. I'll put mu s n on the right. So now I have t cosine theta equals mu s times n. And then bring that mu s down to the denominator and flip sides to get normal force equals t cosine theta over mu s. Okay, let me call that equation three. Now I'm going to take this expression for the normal force and stick it into equation two. I then get minus mg plus t sine theta plus, making the substitution, t cosine theta divided by mu s equals zero. Okay, so now we have one equation and one unknown. We want to solve for the tension. So I can start by factoring the t out of both of these terms. I then have minus mg plus t times the quantity sine theta plus cosine theta over mu s equals zero. Okay, now to complete the solution, we take that minus mg, put it on the right where it becomes plus mg, and then divide by this expression in the parentheses so that we get tension equals, okay, putting the mg on the right, mg divided by sine theta plus cosine theta over mu s. So notice that in solving for the tension, I solved symbolically. I waited until the very end to put the numerical values in, but now we are at the end, so I'm going to put the numerical values in. Okay, so the mass is five kilograms, and I substitute with units, so there's my kilograms. A G, 9.8 meters per second squared, and then divide, so we have sine 40 plus cosine 40 divided by the coefficient of static friction, 0 0.35. And then putting that into your calculator, I got 17.3 Newtons. And now we have completed our second example problem using static friction. Notice that in this example problem, the static friction was maxed out, so we used the formula for the maximum value of the static friction. In the previous problem, static friction was not maxed out, so we just used the generic expression F sub S.